the insanity defense. It's a legal concept that has captivated and divided the public for centuries. Imagine a crime, often violent, shocking in its brutality, then picture the perpetrator, not a hardened criminal, but someone deemed insane. This is where the controversy lies. The insanity defense argues that a person should not be held criminally responsible for their actions due to a mental illness. It's a defense shrouded in misunderstanding. The reality is far more complex. Join me as we navigate the labyrinth of the insane defense, seeking to understand this complex and often misunderstood aspect of our justice system. The insanity defense hinges on a crucial distinction. Legal insanity is not the same as psychiatric insanity. While psychiatrists diagnose mental illnesses, the law determines criminal responsibility differently. Legally, insanity revolves around the defendant's mental state at the time of the crime. It questions if the individual could understand their actions or distinguish right from wrong. A diagnosis alone doesn't equate to legal insanity. The law focuses on the illness's impact on forming criminal intent. This distinction underscores the legal system's focus on culpability. The year is 1843. Daniel Monoton, a Scottish woodturner, assassinates Edward Drummond, secretary to the British Prime Minister. Monoton, suffering from paranoid delusions, believed he was persecuted by the Tory party. He mistook Drummond for the Prime Minister. This case gave rise to the Monoton Rules, a standard for legal insanity. The Monoton Rules established a test for insanity still influential today. Monoton's acquittal on grounds of insanity sparked public outrage and debate. On March 30th, 1981, John Hinckley Jr. attempted to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. Hinckley, obsessed with actress Jodie Foster, believed this act would win her affection. The trial captivated the nation, becoming a flashpoint in the debate on the insanity defense. Hinckley's defense team argued he was driven by delusions stemming from severe mental illness. The prosecution countered, presenting evidence of Hinckley's premeditation and attempts to evade capture. The jury, after weeks of deliberation, found Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity. This verdict sent shockwaves across the country. Public outcry was swift and fierce. Many saw it as an injustice, a wealthy, privileged individual escaping justice through a legal loophole. The Hinckley case exposed the deep-seated anxieties and skepticism surrounding the insanity defense, fueling demands for reform and raising questions about its fairness and application. In 2001, Andrea Yates, a Texas mother suffering from severe postpartum psychosis, systematically drowned her five young children in the bathtub. The case sent shockwaves through the nation, prompting widespread debate on mental illness, motherhood, and the limits of the insanity defense. Yates' defense argued that her psychosis rendered her incapable of understanding the wrongfulness of her actions. The prosecution, however, argued she knew right from wrong, highlighting her attempts to conceal the crime. The jury initially found Yates guilty. However, a retrial was ordered due to a prosecution witness's false testimony. In the second trial, the jury found Yates not guilty by reason of insanity. This verdict, while still controversial, sparked a broader conversation about postpartum mental health, highlighting the need for greater awareness, support and resources for mothers struggling with mental illness. The success rate of the insanity defense is a subject of much misconception. Contrary to popular belief, it is a rarely used and even more rarely successful defense strategy. Studies estimate it is raised in less than 1% of felony cases, with a success rate of only 25%. The high-profile cases discussed earlier contribute to the perception of the insanity defense as a get-out-of-jail-free card. However, these cases represent a skewed sample, disproportionately covered by media due to their sensational nature. In reality, defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity often face indefinite confinement in psychiatric facilities, subject to rigorous evaluation and treatment. This reality contrasts sharply with public perception, which often views the defense as an easy way to escape punishment. The truth, however, is far more nuanced. The insanity defense remains one of the most misunderstood and misrepresented legal concepts. Fueled by sensationalized media portrayals and high-profile cases, 
Public perception is often shrouded in fear and skepticism. Many believe the defense is used far more frequently than it is and that it allows guilty individuals to fake insanity and evade justice. This perception, however, is not supported by data. The low success rate of the defense suggests that juries are generally reluctant to accept it unless overwhelming evidence of insanity exists. Misconceptions about the consequences of a successful insanity plea also abound. The public is often unaware that defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity are rarely set free. Instead, they face indefinite confinement in psychiatric institutions, often for longer periods than they would have served in prison. These misconceptions highlight the need for greater public education and awareness regarding the realities of the insanity defense. Section 8, the aftermath reforms and lasting impacts. The use of the insanity defense, particularly in high profile cases, often leads to public outcry and calls for reform. The Hinckley case, for example, sparked a wave of legislative changes across the United States. Some states moved to abolish the insanity defense outright, while others adopted stricter standards for its application. The federal government, too, responded with the Insanity Defense Reform Act of 1984, shifting the burden of proof to the defense and narrowing the definition of insanity. These reforms reflect the ongoing tension between upholding the rights of the mentally ill and protecting public safety. The challenge lies in striking a balance, ensuring that individuals are not held criminally responsible for acts committed while incapable of understanding their actions due to mental illness, while simultaneously safeguarding society from potentially dangerous individuals. Section 9. The Ethics of the Insanity Defence the insanity defense raises profound ethical questions about the nature of free will, responsibility, and the very definition of justice. If an individual is incapable of controlling their actions due to a severe mental illness, can they be held morally responsible for their crimes? Opponents of the defense argue that it undermines the principle of accountability, allowing individuals to escape punishment for even the most heinous acts. They contend that the defense is susceptible to manipulation, and that it diminishes the severity of crimes. Conversely, proponents argue that the defense is a cornerstone of a humane justice system. They posit that it recognizes the fundamental difference between individuals with sound minds and those whose actions are driven by severe mental illness. To punish the latter, they argue, is not only unjust, but also counterproductive to the goals of rehabilitation and societal safety. Section 10. The future of the insanity plea. The future of the insanity defense remains uncertain. While it has faced challenges and calls for abolition, it continues to endure as a fundamental aspect of our legal system. However, its form and application are likely to evolve as our understanding of mental illness advances and societal attitudes shift. One potential avenue for reform is the guilty but mentally ill verdict adopted by some states. This verdict acknowledges the defendant's mental illness while still holding them accountable for their actions. It represents an attempt to bridge the gap between punishment and treatment, recognizing the complexities of mental illness within the criminal justice system. Ultimately, the future of the insanity defense hinges on our collective willingness to engage in a nuanced and compassionate dialogue about mental illness, culpability, and the purpose of punishment. It demands a delicate balancing act, safeguarding individual rights while ensuring public safety and upholding the principles of justice. Section 11. Conclusion, Balancing Justice and Mental Illness. The insanity defense stands as a testament to the complexities of our legal system and the enduring challenge of balancing justice with compassion. It reflects our evolving understanding of mental illness and its profound impact on human behavior. While the defense has faced criticism and calls for reform, it remains a vital safeguard, protecting individuals whose actions are driven by severe mental illness from undue punishment. It acknowledges that not all criminal acts stem from rational choice and that culpability requires the capacity to understand the wrongfulness of one's actions. As we move forward, it is imperative to engage in informed and compassionate discussions about the insanity defense. We must strive to dispel misconceptions and promote a deeper understanding of mental illness within the legal system. 
Only then can we hope to strike a balance between upholding individual rights, ensuring public safety, and delivering justice that is both fair and humane.